We're not treating her for two completely separate diseases because you think lupus will win you a prize. You put her on steroids too? Doctors! I can't feel them at all. I don't think I can move them. Bowman has completely lost control of the situation. Clearly he needs to drop a house line to pull people back in line. It's okay if we have different opinions. I can't force you to be right. Remember when I asked for your opinion? Yeah, neither do I. You have the right to your opinion and I have the right to think you're an idiot. Very excited to be reacting to House in D season four, episode six, whatever it takes. On this channel, we are reacting to all 177 house videos and this will be episode 87. Let's see if I can get the diagnosis before House does as a doctor working in London. I feel like throwing up my guts. You always feel like throwing up. Come on, dad, let's get this digger on the line. You sure you don't want to go to law school? I hate lawyers. Hey. <laughs> How does it feel to be nine-time national champion Tony Khan? Case, Frank at the end. There is nothing more dramatic than a collapse or a seizure and Universal clearly know that, which is why 95% of episodes seem to start with one. But what they don't start with is a Formula One style race car. Being an F1 driver is one of those spots people look at and think, I can do that. I beat the VW Golf for the lights last week. But the actual sport is one of the most physically intensive. A Formula 1 car can accelerate from 0 to 60 in 2.6 seconds, which generates 2 Gs of force. If you've ever experienced a free fall while skydiving, then that's 1 G, so imagine double that. Then take that force and triple it because when braking, F1 drivers can experience 6 Gs of force. No wonder they get so sweaty after a race, or should I say we, because apparently I look like Daniel Ricciardo, although my bank definitely don't think so. So far we know she passed out and things were getting quite trippy and fuzzy just before she did, but we definitely need more clues. Tell me about Speed Racer. Female. Seizure with visual and auditory processing deficiency. Her lab shows signs of dehydration. Excuse me. Can we talk in private? You're with the CIA. One of our employees just returned from an assignment sick. Uh, we believe he may be the victim of an assassination attempt. If you're willing to help us, we need to leave now. Get a fresh history, neurological exam, and an MRI of her head. Come on, CIA? Do you seriously expect anyone to believe that? It helps when you have props. She just had another seizure, and now she's getting a vertical nystagmus. The only thing more exciting than being drafted for a secret mission for the CIA is vertical nystagmus. We've definitely not had that symptom before. What even is vertical nystagmus though? Is this rapid jerking of the eyes that all of us can get if we're moving our body while trying to track something or trying to focus on a moving object. Sometimes our balance and coordination systems like the inner ear or cerebellum misfire, causing these jerks when they're not supposed to be there. There are a few things that can cause it, including botulism, MS, cancers, brain infections, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> so bad. The team believe it's possibly due to a condition called Miller-Fisher syndrome, but what even is that? It's a variant of Guillain-Barre where instead of getting paralysis going from the feet upwards, it starts from the head and moves downwards. It can be triggered by a gut infection or certain viruses just like Guillain-Barre and is also because of a loss of insulation around nerves called the myelin sheath. But I have another theory. You see, the episode title is called Whatever It Takes and right before the start, the dad says he's feeling sick and the girl said she's feeling good almost like she's not even nervous. So what if she took a drug to increase her focus just before the race like Ritalin or there was an old drug called Tacrine that F1 drivers used to help with their memory and focus. That's really interesting as you know what one of the biggest mimics of Miller-Fisher syndrome is, pesticide poisoning. You know how pesticides work exactly the same way as tacrine by stopping the breakdown of our rest and digest nervous system neurotransmitters. The theory is just perfect, has to win my first diagnostic guess. Am I right? Let's find out. You said there was nothing wrong. You said you were short. We just need to start the plasmapheresis. No, I'm not letting you touch me. I wanna see house. So, where is the poor sick fella? I'm gonna do what doctors aren't supposed to do. Admit I made a mistake. Honey, do you know where you are? She's burning up. Miller Fisher doesn't cause delirium fever. I don't know what this is. Oh, fever and confusion. Also, symptoms of tacrine poisoning. 
Interestingly, that drug was actually banned in the early 2010s because of how toxic it was on the liver. Even though it was approved for use in Alzheimer's, other things we would expect to come next include low heart rate, high saliva output, small pupils, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and muscle tremors as well. It definitely could throw the team off and make them think that she has an infection when she doesn't because of the fever, such a good diagnosis. It isn't just drugs that can mimic pesticide poisoning though, nerve gas actually has this exact same mechanism as well. There are many different types like the original ones called sarin and tabun, which are already some of the most toxic chemical agents. Five to 10 mils on the skin can be fatal and lead to death in minutes. It was used in 1988 when Saddam attacked a Kurdish city and killed almost 5,000 people. That isn't even the strongest one though, as Venomous Agent X or VX can kill a person with just one mil on the skin. Thankfully, it hasn't been used in any major attacks. But question for you smart people, if the rest and digest nervous system that these nerve agents target uses acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter, which one does the fight or flight nervous system use? Answers down below. <laughs> Five days ago, he was 185 pounds. Would it hurt the patient if you let us run some tests? You've got three hours. It's just pancreatitis. He's not an alcoholic. Let's treat for radiation poisoning. We should celebrate with a beer or eight. Protein 65, glucose 70. It's MS. Start on interferon. It reads 95, ANA is weekly positive. Positive, it's lupus. We're not treating her for two completely separate diseases because you think lupus will win you a prize. You put her on steroids too? Doctors! I can't feel them at all. I don't think I can move them. Foreman has completely lost control of the situation. Clearly, he needs to drop a house line to pull people back in line. It's okay if we have different opinions. I can't force you to be right. Remember when I asked for your opinion? Yeah, neither do I. You have the right to your opinion and I have the right to think you're an idiot. None of this work in real life, by the way, don't use them. Now we have two patients to diagnose, the CIA guy who apparently was off to Bolivia for 11 months and our patient with the high protein in the spinal fluid and raised sed rate. Let's start with John, Mr. CIA. We know he's had massive weight loss and a whole body rash while being negative for toxins. We don't know if he's got severe diarrhea, if he smokes or has any family history, so let's run a differential. Metabolic could be acute intermittent porphyria, inflammatory could be scleroderma or inflammatory bowel disease, degenerative possibly amyloidosis, neoplastic lymphoma, especially since a CIA agent probably flies a lot and may get exposed to radiation elsewhere too. Infectious could be staph infections or a severe gut infection. Toxins could include idiopathic environmental intolerance where people can be overly sensitive to perfumes, cleaning products, or even pesticides leading to John's reactions. My first diagnostic guess, I'm quite fond of idiopathic environmental intolerance because it would be quite amusing if a CIA agent wasn't actually poisoned but almost got taken out by a bit of hand soap that will be my first diagnostic guess for the second patient for the first patient the said rate they mentioned is a really non-specific screening test for autoimmune conditions but it can also be raised in infections as well to run it it's actually quite interesting they basically leave the blood in a tube for an hour and see how much it falls by the more it falls the higher the levels of inflammation in the body that's because inflammation increases the levels of fibrinogen an important clotting protein that clumps those blood cells together causing the sediment to form faster the more specific antibody test was negative making lupus unlikely. I also think MS is unlikely as well though as the MRI was normal and there's no evidence of a focal problem like arm weakness or eye pain and reduced vision on one side which you would need to diagnose it. So I'm holding my guesses for patient one but such a spicy episode. Hop on the company jet. Little trip down Mexico way. I'm not talking about the country or the plane. You're pretty cheery for someone who was just proved wrong about his pancreatitis theory. I'm eating his lunch. Withholding nutrients is the treatment for pancreatitis. I did unhook your iodine, though. John. Any chance is just overwhelmed with gratitude? Most people when faced with the CIA would change their practice to be a slight bit more cautious. It seems like the Hawthorne effect only affects us mere mortals, 
not house. The effect is that people act differently when they're being observed and it can be a huge problem in research. The Hawthorne effect is named after a famous experiment done in the 1920s at the Hawthorne complex. It was sponsored by the electricity industry who wanted people to use more lights. The idea was that with the lights on, people could see the work that others are doing and so the workers would be more inclined to work hard to avoid judgment. Hence the name, the Hawthorne effect. It should probably be renamed now as it's been shown that the original experiments were so full of biases and had variable outcomes that the sponsoring electricity industry ended up asking for the evidence to be destroyed. There is some more recent evidence that supports the effect, but data is still difficult to get because of this one question. How do you ethically observe someone without them knowing they're being observed. If you can answer that question, then scientists will be very interested to hear from you. We may not be hearing from the CIA patient John for much longer though, unless we figure out what's wrong with him. We know that he got worse after House starved him. I can think of a very rare condition that could cause that, named MCAD. It's an abnormality in the body's ability to metabolize fat for energy. So if they get to a point when they're not eating and need to start burning fat, then they can get very unwell. For a CIA operative that could be out in the field or when you're back at base camp and your dinner goes to your doctor. The treatment would be a dream for many people taking frequent high sugar drinks while unwell and to make sure to have regular meals. That would be a great diagnosis. I'm going for that as my second diagnostic guess. Given its quick progression, we gotta assume botulism. It's not botulism, it's polio. Polio, it's crazy. House wouldn't think so. So go find House and tell him your theory. Take a personal day. I'm starting the botulism treatment. The rest of you look for confirmation. You hadn't interfered ah. with- Radiation sickness kills specific cells at specific times. His hair should be coming out in clumps. It's blood cancer, Waldenstrom. I'll arrange for plasma for rhesus and chemo. Are you gonna trust him after what he did? I don't have to trust him to agree with him. Let her rip. Now we got the medical stuff out of the way. Why don't we meet back at your place for some enhanced interrogation techniques? You actually cure this guy, I'll show you my private waterboard. Private waterboard? I didn't know the CIA did classes on surfing. I hope they also do classes on dealing with chlamydia. I love these double patient cases, always so interesting. House and his future ex seem to think Waldenstrom's is the most likely diagnosis here, and pancreatitis or radiation sickness are now off the list. But what is Waldenstrom's? It's a rare type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that has excessive production of an antibody called monoclonal immunoglobulin M. It's a goliath compared to usual antibodies and starts to build up in various places like blood and bone marrow causing thick blood, high levels of B cells, suppressions of bone marrow, and big lymph nodes or a spleen. Blood tests can diagnose it by detecting the antibody and it can be confirmed with a bone marrow sample before for starting chemotherapy and further damaging his whole body, which is what the team are doing here. But what about patient one? Foreman has laid down the law and declared it is botulism, although the polio suggestion got one of the candidates taken out, which means that's probably the diagnosis just for the story. Both are pretty good suggestions in all fairness. Botulism is because of the most potent toxin known to man named botulinum toxin or Botox, Ingesting the bacteria that causes it, like in improperly canned foods or preserved foods, can lead to it, or honey in babies under one year old. You could test for it by taking blood samples or stool, and treatment would be with an antitoxin. Polio is an interesting one because there were no cases in the US from around 1979 to 2022 because of introduction of the vaccine. In recent years though, people have been getting more and more worried about vaccines and the first case of paralytic polio happened last year in an unvaccinated man in New York. He was unfortunately paralyzed by the disease as well. Crazy stuff, definitely get your vaccines. They do not cause autism and Andrew Wakefield, who is the person who made those claims, was discredited and sent to prison for falsifying the evidence. Yes, vaccines are not perfect and they do have some risks of side effects, but the diseases they prevent are way worse, which is why the vaccines exist in the first place. Either way, polio gets my second diagnostic guess for patient one. We need to consult an oncologist about the chemo. You offering me a job? We've only had one assassination attempt. And I'm sure you're a great boss. That's why your fellows left en masse a couple of months ago. Oh my God, you're actually at the CIA. Waldenstrom's. Recommended dose is 25 milligrams per meter squared. You tested her without telling me? It's positive. She has polio. Now what, boss? 
Now what, boss? Now what, boss? Even after he got kicked off the case, that was colder than a liquid nitrogen bath in Siberia. I have to admit here, I'm no international expert on treating polio, and why would I be? There have been zero UK cases of paralysis due to polio since 1984. But to my knowledge, there is no treatment proven to work on polio. That means we can help with the pain or give walking aids or therapy, but not much more. Polio can be a mild condition, but in less than 1% of cases, that can actually lead to paralysis, then it is very severe. And that can be fatal in 5 to 10% of patients, depending on their age. Even though this disease has basically been eliminated in most places, almost 100% of cases in the last five years have been from two countries, Pakistan and Afghanistan. That's because there's been significant political instability, movement of people, poor healthcare infrastructure, and water sanitation, which sadly has led to these cases, which were above 100 in 2020, but thankfully dropping below 10 in 2022. I know our patient here doesn't shy away from a tough ride, but this may be her most difficult one yet. My hair is falling out. So what does that mean? It means you don't have cancer. Someone actually did try to kill you. You may have cost that man his life. He's getting the radiation treatment. 24 hours too late. Cordyceps sinesis. It's a... It's an herbal treatment, and it's been shown to mitigate bone marrow damage from radiation poisoning in monkeys. Nothing's gonna help her. She's got polio. Vitamin C. Extremely high doses. It was experimental treatment protocol in the 50s. I just want to force feed her some orange juice. If there's anything you learned today, it's got to be that you can be wrong. When Western medicine fails, then it's back to the natural methods we go. Remember, where did many of Western medicines even come from? Traditional medicine. 40% of pharmaceutical products today draw from natural knowledge, including aspirin. The story of Nobel Prize winning scientist Tu Yao Yao reminds us of why this is. Tu was trying to find a cure for malaria that was resistant to a common drug called chloroquine. After unsuccessfully testing over 200,000 compounds, she thought to look to Chinese medicine for the answer. In it, she found a text about how sweet wormwood could treat fevers. Her team then isolated a new drug called artemisin that has saved countless lives as a result. Another example is willow bark. Traditional medicine has used this as a pain reliever for over 3,000 years as Egyptians used to rub the bark on their skin for pain relief or the ancient Greeks using it to reduce the pain of childbirth. Now, after it was isolated by Felix Hoffman in 1897, it has helped millions of people prevent heart attacks and strokes while relieving pain and swelling. So before we discount natural medicine, let's remember that one of the most used drugs in the world came from there. Of course, that doesn't mean all natural medicine will work, and we shouldn't avoid conventional medicine if there is a good option available. But when there are no other options, like in this case, what is there to lose? You're dying or not? Probably. Oh no, that related down there. I spent all 40 days with his attache and minister of defense. Carnival bleed is only eight days. You have any idea what a chestnut looks like? You idiot. Whoever knew that John was stationed in Brazil, not Bolivia? In Bolivia, chestnuts are chestnuts. Brazil, on the other hand, has castanhas do Pará. Because it would be stupid for people from Brazil to call them Brazil nuts. He had a lot of Brazil nuts, which is a big deal because they contain selenium. Selenium toxicity from Brazil nuts. Now that's a diagnosis. You see, each Brazil nut contains around 90 micrograms and the average adult needs only 400 micrograms a day. So you can have too much with just five Brazil nuts. Our man was eating hundreds leading to selenosis. That can cause garlicky odor in the breath or a metallic taste in the mouth, or less commonly, hair loss, confusion, skin rashes, or even loss of teeth. Believe it or not, treatment doesn't include Brazil nuts and is based on the gradual elimination of selenium from the body as there is no direct antidote. This is house though, so I'm sure he'll just fashion a special dialysis machine from a toothpick and a washing machine filter to get him better in time for some private waterboarding. Let's not forget about patient one too, who is receiving obscene amounts of vitamin C. I know I said to keep an open mind about alternative therapy, but this one actually has a contentious past. You see, many alternative medicine practitioners have claimed that vitamin C megadosing can cure cancer and AIDS, 
but the science isn't so convincing. I'm a sucker for a great story though, and this one needs a happy ending, which I'm sure will deliver in more ways than one. Freeman's chelation, same as for radiation sickness. The only difference is it works a lot better on nut poisoning. Is it working? Yeah. You feel that? Yeah. It's working. Dr. House, appreciate your help. I miss people doing whatever it takes to get the job done. I shouldn't have helped them mess with your patient. We had polio. We cured it with vitamin C. It worked. No, it didn't. We tested her blood from admittance. No polio. It means Brennan screwed up the lab tests. And the alternative is unbelievably convoluted. Some doctor would have to poison her with thallium. It is kind of doable, right? You poisoned her? Foreman was right about the heat stroke. This will make them do research. Well, what do you care if I faked a lab test if it saves a few thousand lives? You're gonna quit. Who the hell did I leave in charge? Next time, listen to him. He poisoned the patient, faked a test, and all while proving Foreman wrong on each occasion. Madness. It is interesting though because the hierarchy in the hospital is very established just like it is in the army. Imagine Foreman as a sergeant and his cadet goes behind his back doing what he did. Yes, in hospital there wouldn't be push-ups and extra drills, but public beratings and ridicule are very much on the menu. Authority is so important in hospitals, for example, that doctors in the US are classed by rank based on the length of their coats. Interns wear hip length coats, residents get a length upgrade going down to the mid thigh, and attendings get a coat that goes all the way to the knees. This status symbol ends up having a profound effect on how the doctor's orders are treated. Even without announcing their rank, interns are more likely to have their orders and diagnoses questioned by nurses, whereas the long coats command obedience simply by their presence. Foreman isn't wearing a coat right now, but after House's speech, there definitely would be growth of a few inches. Hi. Hi. I'm going to take you up on your offer. I gave notice today. I'll see you at nine o'clock on Monday. Oh, finally, they fixed the one thing House episodes were lacking, sexual tension. I think House needs a moment before walking home. Very interesting episode. I've got to give it an 8.5 out of 10 entertainment, 7.5 out of 10 accuracy, 8 out of 10 diagnosis. This episode doesn't make full sense though until you watch the previous one where a patient needs to find his true identity here.